Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in this lecture for guitar amplification and effects, I'm going to look at the self-bias scheme for a certain common cathode amplifier, namely the first preamplifier stage and the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier. We'll look at the small signal characteristics of the circuit later on. In this lecture, I'm just going to look at the biasing. The Mesa Boogie Company was started by Randall Smith, and I think you could argue that the main thing that Randall Smith pioneered was how to mass produce quality amplifiers. At the time Mesa Boogie got started, people had started to make amplifiers with PCBs as a cost saving measure, but I think some companies used low quality PCBs and other low quality components. And as a result, PCBs got a bad name among guitar players. But there's nothing inherently wrong with PCBs. You could make a PCB amplifier that sounds just as good as a point-to-point -point hand wired amplifier. So I think the Mesa Boogie folks basically said, let's use PCBs, but let's do it right. I like to use the dual rectifier as a case study for this class because there is a lot of stuff in the amp. So there's lots of different things to talk about. A lot of people are turned off by the level of complexity of something like the dual rectifier. And so if the dual rectifier and amps like it aren't for you, that's fine. You can choose maybe a variety of simpler amplifiers, whatever works for you. We're going to be focusing on the part of the circuit right here. So even on its own, this initial input stage is more complicated than what you'll find in a lot of amplifiers, and it has to do with this network down here. So LDR here stands for light dependent resistor. The Mesa Boogie has a lot of different configurations that you can put the amplifier in, and these light dependent resistors are basically being used as switches. So rather than having a whole bunch of mechanical switches, these are being used as electrical switches to allow a bunch of settings in the amplifier to change at once. We'll dig into the possibilities that this provides a little bit later. Now, as far as addressing the bias scheme goes, we don't need to worry about this capacitor and this LDR and all that, because for determining biasing, we consider this to be an open circuit anyway, and we ignore the input, and the circuit simplifies to this. So we have a 1.8K cathode resistor and a 220K load resistor. Again, this load resistor, you often see this called RP for plate. And I really want to call it RP for plate because we're not indicating the load of circuits downstream in the amplifier. This is a resistor we're putting here as part of this preamplifier network. The reason I like to use RL instead of big RP here is we use little RP for the small signal plate resistance. And I find just using a capital and a lowercase to be the only differentiation between these things to be a little bit confusing. So I had to choose which kind of confusion I preferred, <laughs> and I wound up with this one. I keep changing my mind on this, but this is what I'm doing for now. For the technician, the engineers at Mesa Boogie conveniently provided this 200 volt and this 1.6 volt markings on the schematic. Pretend that we don't have those. We're going to try to compute what these should be and then see if we get values on the schematic. I should also mention that I know this voltage E is 402 volts. Oh, I should have wrote volts in here. Anyway, it's 402 volts, and I know that from looking at the power supply schematics. Oh, and I should mention something about this 1K8. If you see something like K inside of a number like this, this indicates something like 1.8K. So by using K in place of the decimal point or M in place of the decimal point if it's in mega ohms, what this lets you do is to have a way of avoiding the problem of disappearing dots. So especially in older photocopying processes, mimeograph style processes, blueprint style processes, it's very easy for small features like a decimal point to disappear. And it would be really sad if a decimal point disappeared and somebody got the impression that a 1.8K resistor was actually 18K. So this is a convention that avoids that kind of problem.
And I should clarify, when I said ignore the input, I mean set it to ground, not leave the input open. So that's the DC circuit, and we'll look at that in more detail in a few minutes. The small signal circuit is interesting here because now this light-dependent resistor matters. For the small signal analysis, we're going to set the positive voltage rail to AC ground. We now have a small signal input coming into our grid, which our original input had a DC value of zero, so that's not actually that interesting. I'm going to ignore the one mega ohm resistor here. It's not terribly important as far as our gain analysis goes. It's important to have this here as a ground reference for if you don't have anything plugged into the amplifier so you don't get a problem with electrons building up on the grid creating a pop when you plug something into the amp. So this one mega ohm resistor essentially sets the input impedance of your amplifier. All right, so the interesting part is this network down here. For a small signal analysis, we're going to assume here that this capacitor is a short Later in the class, we'll analyze that question in more detail about what this capacitor can do to your frequency response. For right now, the interesting question is whether this LDR is switched in or not. So if the LDR closes, all of the resistors here are bypassed, and you wind up with a cathode resistance of zero. If you don't have it switched in, then you have these two resistors in parallel. And if you compute what that is, you wind up with something around 1.7K. I'm going to leave the actual computation of gains and the output impedances for a future lecture. We need to develop a lot more machinery before we can talk about that. But for right now, I'll just give you a preview and tell you that the setting on the left is the higher gain setting, and the setting on the right is the lower gain setting. Essentially, this provides cathode degeneration, which is analogous to emitter degeneration or source degeneration in a transistor amplifier circuit. All right, so I've been blathering for seven minutes. Let's get to the main topic of the video, which is figuring out the bias points. This is the kind of computation we're going to do a lot over the next month or so, so pay attention. So here's the bias circuit. We have this load resistance. Again, this is an intentional part of the circuit, not something that we're hooking the circuit to. Here we have the cathode resistance, and then we have our triode in the middle here. Now, remember no current is flowing through the grid under normal operating conditions, so we only have one path for the current to go here. So we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law and say that the power supply voltage is going to equal two voltage drops. One is a drop between the plate and the cathode of the triode, and the other is a drop across these resistors that I can compute using Ohm's law. So I can take VPK, move it to the other side of the equation so it appears over here. I'm also flipping both sides of the equation. And then I can divide both sides of the equation by RL plus RK to wind up with this expression here. And we have the equation of a line where we plug in a plate cathode voltage and we get a current out. So this corresponds to a line on one of these plate characteristic, aka output characteristic charts. So if you have a ruler or some other straight edge, all you need to do to draw this line is to compute two points. Two of them are particularly convenient. At one extreme, let's talk about a hypothetical situation where all of the supply voltage is dropping across the tube. Well, if we do that, the numerator cancels out and we just wind up with zero. So this corresponds to a place on the vertical axis of zero and a place on the horizontal axis of 402 volts in this case, which in trying to plot this point, watch it, there it is. I basically rounded it to 400. I wasn't going to try to get pixel perfect here. Now to draw a line, we're going to need another point. So let's pick a point that's associated with this vertical axis. Now, notice that this would be associated with a zone where the grid to cathode voltage is positive. So this is not a realistic place of operation. This is just a point we're plotting in order to draw a line. So at that extreme, the plate cathode voltage is zero. And so if we plug in zero for VPK, we wind up with VPP 
over RL plus RK. So that's something we can compute. If we were to plug in 402 volts for VPP and plug in 220 and 1.8 kilo ohms in the denominator and compute that, we wind up with 1.812 milliamps. Now, when doing things off the cuff, quite often people will make an approximation where they'll say, okay, well, this load resistance is usually a lot bigger than the cathode resistance. And that's usually the case if you're building a standard amplifier where you want a lot of gain. This is not the case if you're building a cathodyne, but that's another topic for another day. Anyway, if this condition holds, then you can approximate the denominator as just being RL because RK is probably negligible relative to RL. And in this case, it is a pretty good approximation. We wind up with 1.827 milliamps. Because we have calculators nowadays, I pretty much usually just always go ahead and include RK just because I can. To plot this on the graph, I'm going to round this to 1.8 milliamps. And I can find that right around here. Have to be careful with this. This is a case where we have 0.05 per division. So every two divisions is 0.1. All right, ready? Here it comes. There it is. All right, so now I have two points, and we can take our electronic straight edge here and draw on a line between those. So we know that our bias point lives somewhere along this line. Now to figure out exactly where, we need to get the grid cathode voltage lines involved. This is a little bit tricky because doing this takes some combination of experience and guesswork. If you have more experience, you can usually get away with less guesswork. If you have less experience, you might need some more guesswork, but eventually you'll get the right answer. Now, if you want to know what the grid to cathode voltage is, well, the voltage at the grid relative to ground is just zero because it's grounded. And you might say, well, the voltage at the cathode relative to ground is easy to find. It's just 1.6. Somebody wrote it on the schematic. But remember, we usually don't have that. We're pretending we haven't seen this, and we're pretending that we haven't seen this. So we need to figure out what the voltage at the cathode relative to ground is. Well, that voltage is just going to be the current through the plate. That's the same as the current through the cathode times the cathode resistance. So the grid to cathode voltage is zero minus that cathode voltage. So I have a minus sign in front here. And you can rearrange that expression and get the plate current in terms of your hypothesized grid to cathode voltage and the cathode resistance. And here's where the trial and error part comes in. Basically, you need to try some values of VGK, compute some IPs, and then plot some points to draw some lines and see if you can get a line that intersects with the load line you already drew. So these grid lines, in order to compute those, you don't choose just any VGK. You try ones that the data sheet actually gives you lines for. Okay, so let's start by plugging in minus 1.5 volts for VGK. Notice that there's a minus sign in front that cancels with the minus sign from the minus in the VGK. So those cancel, giving us a positive 0.833 milliamps. So we'll need to put that on our plot. And if we plug in minus 2 volts and divide that by 1.8K, we get 1.111 milliamps. So let's put these onto our plot. So rounding that 0.8333 to something like 0.8 would put us something like here. So let's draw a line in there, and it's going to extend out to match up with this minus 1.5. For the VGK equal minus 2 volt line, that will be at something like 1.1 milliamps. So that's going to be something like here. So sliding that in and intersecting with that line, we get a point something like here. And now we can draw a grid line that's connecting those two. And now we want to find out where these intersect. So if we take a look at that point and project it left, we would wind up with 0.9 milliamps. And as far as what our quiescent operating plate voltage is, our VPK, well, that looks to be around 200 volts. So here's our operating point.
Now, the other thing that would be interesting to know is what the actual operating point is as far as VGK goes. That's a little hard to figure out from this kind of graph because notice these aren't really straight lines. They're kind of doing this curve kind of thing. So you could try to eyeball something in between minus 1.5 and minus 2 volts. It's probably closer to minus 1.5 than minus 2. Again, we are eyeballing everything. But we can actually compute it exactly, assuming we believe these values that we have here. So we can take that original VGK formula, compute it in terms of the quiescent operating current that we found, which was 0.9 milliamps. And if we plug in those values, we wind up with minus 1.62 volts, which conveniently matches that 1.6 volts on the Mesa Boogie schematic. So that gives us some faith that we did that right. And if you look up here, okay, well, what's the plate to cathode voltage suggested by the schematic? I guess that would be 198.4 volts would be the difference across there. And that looks pretty close to this 200 I found here. Obviously, on this graph, you're not going to know the difference between 198 and 200. Everything here is just close enough for rock and roll. Now, my conjecture is that this amp was probably originally designed on paper to have a quiescent plate current of one milliamp. And this 0.9 milliamps, which is a number I've seen in a bunch of other amp designs, I bet you that number is what happens when you compute the resistance values you would want for one milliamp and then round those to conveniently available resistor values. That's just a guess. So before we end this lecture, I would like to compute the plate dissipation so this is a power that we compute by multiplying the plate to cathode voltage at the quiescent operating point with the quiescent current. So that's 200 volts times 0.9 milliamps as estimated on this chart. I believe that the exact computation according to what's on the schematic is a little less than 200 volts, but this is close enough. And if we compute this, we wind up with 180 milliwatts. And taking a look at the 12AX7 data sheet, we see that we have a maximum plate dissipation of one watt. So 180 milliwatts is much less than one watt, so we're safe.